Hello, I'm Alan Lee and welcome to Endzone Focus and our series of interviews with leaders of the main political parties as we head into our general election. Well, joining me in the studio this week is the co-leader of the Greens, Materia Touré. Well, Materia, thank you so much for joining us on the programme. Sure You've been in politics for a long time, much longer. Like <laughs> I mean, back in, back in the early 90s, you were with the McGillicuddy Serious yeah. Party. What, what's the attraction of politics? Politics is about social change. Um, it's about the resources. We make decisions in the Parliament about what, who gets what resources at the end of the day. It's really a large part of it. And I come from a very working class Māori family um, who suffered a great deal during the 80s and 90s with the economic reforms, both under national and under Labour. And, and so I've always believed that the people who are affected most by those decisions about resources need to be part of that decision making. And I've had opportunities to do that in lots of different ways, both um, in political action and protest action, but also now in mainstream politics. I think it's a great opportunity to be able to do this decision making at this level for that reason, so that the people who are most affected have someone there who is speaking for them. Because one of the most interesting things about the Greens is that you've been on the edge of power Mm. For, for years, <laughs> never been a coalition partner. We've mm. had confidence in supply, we've had very warm relations between you and the Labour Party, but never a partner. No. Why? I think National and Labour have never really, have only started the process of understanding MMP, of what it means to have a series of relationships with a range of political parties. And the Greens were the ones that set up different kinds of relationships. We were the first to have a cooperation agreement, for example. We've been the first to have a, a memorandum of understanding, which we have with National at the moment, and to try to work cooperatively across the political boundaries based on the things that you agree on as opposed to what you disagree on. That is the MMP way of working, but I think the older parties have found that difficult. We've, we've had difficult relationships with Labour, as well as good ones, and it was certainly disappointing in 2005 when they chose a centre-right government, if you like, rather than a much more left government with the Greens and with the Māori Party. And I also think that a lot of times those are personal decisions. In 2005, it was really an issue between Helen Clark and Tariana Turia, and that, that personal problem that they had actually determined who would be government. And I, I think we mustn't forget that um, the personal politics that goes on is very much affects the practical politics that goes on. MMP, obviously we're voting on MMP and, and whether we keep it or whether we, we go for something else. I know under first past the post, the Greens scored up to nearly 7% of mm. the vote but never got a show in, in government. You presumably would, would support MMP or, mm. or is there a need for change? No, I think we do support, oh well, we absolutely we support MMP. I don't think there is a mood for change. I think the referendum has been part of a political deal that's been done outside of the public realm. Um, the polls are showing very clearly that the majority of New Zealanders want to keep MMP, but there are some things that we need to fix, but if we keep it, we will be able to fix it, because of course there will be the review. Um, but I think also people understand again that it's not just about how you get political parties into Parliament, it's, what, it's how they operate when they are there. And so, you know, the Greens have been very effective in Parliament outside of government. You know, we've won hundreds of millions of dollars worth of good policy, so the home insulation scheme, the electrification of Auckland Rail, uh, fantastic work in the conservation environment, um, and Education for Sustainability was a project that we worked with that was many millions of dollars as well. So so if you think about MMP as the way that political parties cooperate with each other, then actually we're really reforming the way that, that politics is done, and that has to happen. We're a 21st century, modern and progressive country, and we need to behave like that politically as well as in our communities. So is there anyone you, you wouldn't work with? Is there a, a line that you, you wouldn't cross? In some ways I think it's a little childish. You know, <laughs> I'll, I'll pick you for my team and I'll pick you for my team. And, you know, it's a bit, it's silly because at the end of the day, um, after the election, we'll know what the numbers are and we'll get a clear picture of the, the level of support for the political programmes that the public want to see happen. And then it's up to us as politicians to work through to try to get m as much of that programme through as possible. And I think we've got a responsibility to the public to operate in a more responsible, mature manner than that. <laughs> All right, well, let's talk about some of the, the issues that, that they're facing the country. Let, let's start with, with families. Mm. Uh, the anti-smacking legislation, which was introduced by Sue Bradford, you knew I was going to say that, didn't you? You could tell. <laughs> um, 
I caused a furore at the time. Yeah. There is still some some controversy over whether it's achieving anything. And certainly when you look at the statistics, it would seem that it hasn't achieved what it was designed to achieve and that there are still children who are dying at the hands of their caregivers. Well, are we, yeah. I mean, are we, do, are we going the right way? Should we have done something else? Well, it certainly has achieved what the Greens expected to, to achieve, which was to prevent uh, p adults, parents, and those acting as parents, um, having a, le a way of legitimising their violence against children. Um, and we were talking about cases where adults were using weapons against children, like hoses and pieces of wood. Now, the, in, the, in the past, that, could be, that was able to be legitimised in the law. And our change to the law has meant that it's not able to be legitimised. It is not legal to hit your child with a stick. And no one can say, uh, the law doesn't allow for you to get away with that. It was never designed to stop the worst of the, of the child abuse, because actually no law can do that. There is no legislative cure for people's cruelty um, and their mistreatment and their abuse. What the, the cure for that, I guess, is around social cohesion, people working more closely together, that sense of building a community where everyone is held, both held with respect, but also held responsible for their actions by the communities around them. And that's a much more difficult, bigger issue that legislation won't solve. So is that a result of, of the breakdown of, of some of the old traditional family units, do you think? I mean, it sounds like what you're saying is, is that the society that we had maybe half a century ago with the traditional mum, dad, kids, now that's not so strong, it's not there. That's why child abuse is happening. No, I don't think that's the case. I think in the past it's been hidden. I think in the past we have ignored issues around ethnicity and racism, for example. We've ignored issues that trapped women in relationships that were highly abusive and they had no opportunity to speak out about that um, or speak out about the abuse that they saw happening to their children. And now that we have broken down those barriers, those um, sex barriers around sexism and racism, actually we are seeing more of the real story as opposed to having it hidden. That's what I think is changing. But also we must, we must remember that uh, there's a lot of evidence that shows that the more unequal a society is, the bigger the income disparities, the bigger the separation between communities, the more likely we'll see um, elevated levels of violence against children, infant mortality goes up, the life expectancy goes down. You know, we can't separate these issues from the wider socio-economic issues that are happening to our country. And we are increasingly um, unequal country, and poverty is a serious problem in this country that many politicians are only just starting to, to admit is the case. So do you think that, I mean, there is research that, that seems to show that, that the, the old traditional nuclear family is a solution. Do you think that's a bit of a red herring that actually we should be concentrating more on the economics of society? I think we should be concentrating on respecting family as people want to construct their families. And there's lots of different kinds of families and they all deserve respect and love um, and consideration and equal treatment regardless of how they are constructed because actually it's the, their intention, people's intention to care for each other and be responsible for each other that counts and that's what gives a child that love and security that they need to be well. But we, yes we do also have to focus on the economics. We have to work towards being a more equal country where everybody gets a fair go, where it's less divisive, uh, where we don't shut people away from the community because they might get their income from a benefit rather than a job or because they might get their income is very low or any of those things. They are not reasons to separate ourselves from our, from our own people. I know that one of the, the bills that you, you tried to introduce was, was one that, that was aimed at regulating the marketing of, of alcohol. Mm. Now that didn't go through. No. There have been liquor law reforms. Are they enough? Have they gone far enough? Well, unfortunately, the government is still refusing to really control the industry. Um, our view is that you need to control the industry, as we've done with tobacco, but even more so, in order to, uh, rather than punishing people who are users of alcohol, or tobacco for that matter, that you actually deal with the industry and the access to the community. And controlling um, advertising is one of those important ways to do it. Um, the liquor law reforms that are underway at the moment go some way towards um, the issues, but not far enough because, again, they tend to uh, impact on the user of the of that drug of alcohol and tobacco, but not on the on the industry who is you know making a profit and really using all their resources to push 
um, that drug out to the community. But given that alcohol is there, do we as individual adults, um, do we bear some responsibility as well? It, yes. I mean, cause it oh yes, I think so. I do, I agree, absolutely. And I think one of the big problems I have with this continual talk around um, youth alcohol issues and the problems of youth drinking is actually that we as adults show them how to drink. You know, at, at every event you go to, there is alcohol. Alcohol is a, net, is a part of our, the dinners that we have with each other, the community events that we have with each other. Um, and our behaviour, our own behaviour as drinkers, is not good. And yet we expect young people to do something different from what we do. So if we want to genuinely uh, make sure young people have got good role models for how to drink responsibly, we have to take responsibility for that. And I always worry that, again, this is part of separating out the communities. You, you put the young people in the basket of problems and we, we as adults don't take any responsibility for our role here. We'll take a break there and then we'll come back in a couple of minutes. And welcome back to Endzone Focus and our interview with Green Party co-leader Materia Turai. Let's talk about some of the knotty issues. Sure. Abortion is something that people feel very strongly about. Mm. Do the Greens have a, a position on that? We don't as a party because like the community, we too have many different views and we develop our policy through consensus. Um, but our caucus, all the caucus members, um, are of the view that abortion services should be provided to the community um, and that women should be able to make these decisions with all of the information they need to do what's best for themselves and their families. We need to make sure our young women and men have access to good reproductive sexual health information and support. You know, you know young people are sexual beings and we need to respect that and make sure that we, we provide them with what they need to make sensible decisions about their lives and their bodies. And then we need to make sure that there are abortion services and support, adoption services, all of that for, available for those young women so that if they are in that situation, they've got all the information they need to make their decision. I just don't think legislation is going to cure this one for us. I think this is, a, again, about how a community wraps itself around a family for a young woman, young man, to make sure that they've got what they need to have a well life. Let's talk about young people because at the moment there's a desperate shortage of jobs. That, that mm. figure I saw uh, this morning was something like 20% yeah. of 15 to 24 year olds currently don't don't have a job. What's the answer? I mean, we've heard talk of, of reintroducing the minimum youth wage so that they become more attractive to employers. Is there an answer? Well, the Greens actually were the ones that got rid of the minimum youth rate, so uh, we would be horrified if it came back. <laughs> There's no evidence that it increases employment for young people. Um, what I think we need to do is really is to build an economy that is based on, we would call it a smart green economy, where we're using our resources, whether it's our natural resources or our public assets, in a way to support New Zealand business. So we've suggested that you use we use our energy companies, for example, to help support New Zealand businesses who want to develop new energy technologies, clean tech technologies, biofuels, a whole range of things. Um, so that New Zealand businesses have support and that they then are able to grow the jobs that we need for our young people, both in a range of jobs from apprentices on, working on machinery to PhDs in engineering. You know, we need that range. But it needs to be planned and we need to think carefully about the kind of future, the kind of country we will be in 50 years' time, not in three years' time or at the next election. And I think that's been the big problem. So our young people are really suffering from a lack of planning and a lack of vision around the kind of economy that this country could have, especially when it comes to our New Zealand businesses who are in desperate need of support and incentives and um, investment funding. You know, we can change our tax system to make that more possible so our people can work, they can build their businesses and they can thrive in a very uh, amazing new um, international global economy. But some businesses would say that the Greens, because you would stand against, for instance, um, picking up mineral resources mm. that are within, say, our dockland, mm. Um, they would say that that was hindering our development as an economy because there's billions, trillions of dollars I've heard <laughs> yes. buried under the ground. Apparently, apparently there is this huge <laughs> pot of gold just sitting there waiting for us to dig it out. But you can see their point. They, well, they, they, they feel that they're being 
turned out. Well, they, these are the big mineral companies, of course, rather than a small New Zealand business. But if, this is the vision. This is where we lack the vision by other political parties. Our vision is for a smart green economy that doesn't abuse our natural resources, but uses the creative talent that we have in our population that isn't resource intensive, that is about, you know, natural resource intensive, but is about using our creative talent to think about this global market. There's a, a half a trillion dollar global market in new energy technologies right now, developing right now, and we have got the chance for even just a tiny percent of that is, could, could transform the New Zealand economy. If we invest in our kids now with sustainable um, sustainability education, with the new technologies and apprenticeships, uh, with supporting universities and polytechs to provide sustainable education too in these kinds of new technologies, and making sure we have new support for New Zealand businesses to exploit that new market. We don't have to exploit our, our, the dockland that provides us with you know, clean water and clean soils, healthy soils. We need to exploit our own minds, our own creative talent. Some businesses are also concerned about the emissions trading scheme. That they see that as, as something that um, any advantages we gain from, from the ETS are wiped out by the, the blowing up of volcano on the other side of the world, which pumps out more carbon dioxide <laughs> than our trees will ever get rid of in a million years. Does the ETS work? Not as it's currently constructed, no it doesn't. Um, in that we are, the, the public are subsidising the biggest polluters by um, you know, half a billion dollars a year or more. And so at the moment the public is paying for the emissions trading scheme, um, both with increased costs but also in the subsidies. And so we think that we need to f share this responsibility fairly. So those big polluters should be paying their fair share for the pollution that they produce. Um, and that would mean that would save a great deal of money for the New Zealand economy. So we can do things like invest in New Zealand businesses with new clean tech opportunities, uh, like supporting apprenticeships and young people into education and other jobs. There's, this is about, again, it's about the vision of what we think this, the New Zealand economy is going to look like in time. And if we keep thinking the old 19th century, dig out the coal out the hole kind of way, well, that's the kind of economy we're going to continue to have. And it won't serve our kids very well at all. I was looking through your charter and there was a phrase that struck me which says, this world is finite, therefore mm -hmm. unlimited material growth is impossible, which sounds like the old fashioned principle of, of stewardship. Yes. But that would seem to put you at odds with the perhaps the older parties, which are always looking for growth in GDP, which mm. say we should be growing all the time. And they're that, wrong. That, <laughs> <laughs> well, they are I mean, wrong. There's a disconnect there, isn't there? There is a disconnect there because actually, you know, the, the world is physically finite. There is only one planet, and we simply can't keep exploiting it to the level that we are and expect it to continue to support us. And we know that the planet will support us. We can grow our food here. We've got abundant fresh water if we keep it clean for our population. But if we continue to abuse it and pollute it, no, of course it won't support us, and we will be in desperate need like other nations are at the moment. And that's what the Green Party Charter is all about, is talking about that. Because if we want our kids to have a good standard of living and to be well, and for their kids to be well and their kids to be well, then we need to be very careful about what we do with our land and our people now. It is, a, it is an issue of stewardship, absolutely. Let's talk about the health system. Um, sure. Does it work? Actually, the public health system works very well um, in the majority of cases. And I think that um, it's always going to be difficult with an ageing population um, and with, um, you know, costs will always increase and so we need to think really carefully how we manage that. But yes, actually, I think it does work reasonably well most of the time. But we have had, I mean, there, there are cracks that people fall mm. through. I mean, just, just recently we had that terrible story of the, the elderly man in, in Wellington. Who, who died was, and nobody, know, and nobody knew. It. I mean, that's so terrible. It's terrible. Is that a... Is that the fault of government? Is that the fault of family? What, what's the... Uh, he, he, he fell through a whole lot of cracks. You know, you would expect that the landlord would have um, done inspections on that property every few months and, and known that man. You would expect his neighbours to have known who he was or his family to have known that he was there. So, yes, that man was alone, deeply alone. And that's, that's a, a huge tragedy that we have people in that, you know, living in that situation. He's not the only one. There will be many others as well. Um, and so if we truly care about our communities, that's 
we need to genuinely care and act that we care and show and show that we care by being involved in people's lives, not in a judgmental way, but in a community type way. I don't think this was an issue for the health system. I think this is a, a very good example of how separated out we have become from each other. The Greens' relationship with law and order is interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I know we have a few party leaders who who've fallen foul of the law and are in prison. Um, but also, <laughs> not Greens, I hasten to add, no. but, but certainly in, in the past, you know, you, you've, had, you've had Green MPs who will protest yes. and will be arrested yes. on, on various public order offences. Is the law there to protect us or is it there to be challenged? Both. Um, and that, that's, you know, the law is not perfect. I think what... What is important for the Greens is that we are very committed to restorative justice, that, that we don't always have to be punitive and punish when a crime has been committed, that it's about restoring again the connections between the community. Um, for, for those who commit very serious crimes, prison is appropriate, the punishment, the punitive principle is appropriate. But for so many crimes, particularly those that are driven by opportunism or by drug abuse or um, drug misuse where people need help, you know, actually let's provide those people with that help. I've been involved with and, and met with people from Sycamore Tree for example who do programs in prison. You know, there is a, lots of opportunity for us to be engaged with people and to bring them back into the fold. But if we, again, if we keep separating them out and moving them away from us and punishing them, not caring for them, we actually make it worse for ourselves. Um, you know, countries, countries that are more unequal have higher imprisonment rates and more crime than those countries who are more equal. So let's take the economics seriously. But also, you know, if we're talking about young people involved in foolish behaviour, Let's not treat them like they are, you know, mad criminals. Let's actually try and find ways of restoring them back into their families and their community. We talked a bit about adults and, and being um, responsible and, 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 and showing responsibility in terms of the, the example that they, they set for, for young people. Uh, does that work for MPs as well? We, we've seen the expenses <laughs> scandal in, yes. in the UK. Uh, and everyone was, was horrified at, yeah. at what seemed to be basically fiddling the books. Do MPs have a, a responsibility to, to be a sort of moral compass for the rest of us? Yes, I think so. Um, we don't have a huge problem with corruption in this country mm. in general. And the Greens, it was one of my campaigns when I first became co-leader, was to make our expenses transparent. And that now has happened. So because of the Greens, we now can see what MPs are spending on their air flights and their rental cars and hotels and all that sort of thing. And that's good. That's really good. That's at least a good start. Um, but yes, we provide. I think we do provide a moral compass. But it, it's in the context of um, different moral views about things. So, you know, we have very strong... MPs have very strong views about moral issues um, and we need to talk about that more. I don't think MPs talk about their values enough. I don't think they talk about their morality and ethics enough because that is what the community is looking for. They are looking for our moral and ethical direction and, and our value set and whether our value set reflects theirs. And I think that that's um, being challenged to talk about that more is a good thing. If the Greens do find themselves actually being a coalition partner, mm -hmm. what difference would you make? We have three priorities for after this election. Uh, the first is to bring 100,000 children out of poverty. And we, there's 270,000 children living below the poverty line. It's very serious for those children and their families. We can achieve that in three years and we've got the solutions to do that. We will make our rivers swimmable again and that means it's good for our economy, for our farming sector, it's good for our communities who can go to the river and collect their kai, you know, their eels or watercress or whatever, but their kids can play safely in the water. And that's about managing the pollution and controlling and stopping the pollution that goes into our waterways. And we will create thousands of new jobs using both government support but also business incentives. New Zealand business is crying out for ideas on how to how to be invested in, how to get support from the government and we've got those ideas to create jobs. Great, well thank you so much for joining us, it's been great to talk to you, thank you. Kia ora. And that brings this programme to a close, we look forward to seeing you again next week when we'll be talking to the leader of the Kiwi Party, Larry Bulldog. We'll see you then.